morning. I told Gary it was time, and he went and sat down. I guess I'll stand up here as it gets us started this morning. Gene Hill's not here, so everything's up in the air as to what happens. Um, it's always good to be able to gather together on the first day of the week to worship, and at this time, uh, before worship, do Bible study. Uh, Steve, I'll slow down. My brain and my mouth aren't working on the same gears. <clears throat> It's always good to be able to gather together. It's uh, do remember Gene and Jerry as they're traveling. Uh, we heard that some of their grandkids started getting sick at the same time that they're traveling again. So they are maintaining their uh, tradition that they always travel to go and be with their grandkids and kids and someone in the family gets sick and <clears throat> seems to be a family tradition here lately. So uh, we'll pray for them as well and for the family and all that. Um, do remember upcoming events. Uh, we'll go through the details more uh, in a little bit with uh, morning services, but we do have quite a few that are on the list. Uh, I'm not scanning it. I don't see any updates. So uh, we'll be mindful for each of these. Uh, it's with Gene Hill out, uh, we do have Shane and Emily Fisher from Winona with World Evangelism here. Uh, they're going to be presenting the Bible study this morning and also the, uh, the lessons uh, for our worship assemblies. Let's go ahead and start with prayer. <coughs> Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this first day of the week, thankful for all the blessings you have given us this last week. We thank you for the opportunity we have to gather together in your name, and we pray, Father, as we do so at this time, we're able to look into your word and to be able to see more about it and to be able to understand you better. We thank you, Father, for Shane and Emily as they work with World Evangelism and as uh, Shane presents to us this morning. We pray, Father, that the information that's brought out is uh, good and useful and well-received to, to us and for our ability to use and understand. We thank you, Father, for all of the great things that we have in this country and throughout this world. We thank you especially for that of you and of revealing yourself to us and that it was printed down so that we can have it today. We thank you, Father, for the ability we have to uh, look to your word at all times uh, in struggles, in joy, and see all of these different things as we uh, are able to relate to them. And we thank you, Father, for creating us and reaching out to us in such wonderful ways. We thank you for your son who came to this earth uh, um, gave us your word more perfectly and also died for our sins we pray father for that in thanksgiving for that sacrifice we also thank you for um, caring about us that much we pray father as we go about this bible study that our hearts and minds will be open to your word we thank you again for shane for coming and delivering this to us we thank you for the ability of all the preachers and all of those and the missionaries and those that are serving in your fields uh, we pray father for uh, the seed to be sown in the hearts of uh, all and for the increase to be able to happen. We pray, Father, for your love to continue to be able to grow and to shine throughout the world. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Okay. Well, I'm very happy to be with you today, and uh, I presented the same lesson in Cleveland, and I didn't get done with it. So if I skip some slides, there's a reason why I'm doing that, because I really want you to see the end product of this lesson because we want to get to the applications. And so what we're doing is we're looking, what I call, I just wanted to make something very interesting, create the biblical ripple effect. You know, we've all thrown a stone into a lake and seen the ripple effect. Well, I hope you can do the same thing with your Bible study. There's going to be six principles, and I, I call them the ripple, and I hope that you'll be able to use them and you'll gain some better treasures from God's word. And so the first point I want to make is, uh, first, we want to read the whole book through in one sitting. Now, I know that's hard to do with Isaiah and Jeremiah and uh, books like that, but we can certainly do it with the smaller books like Colossians and Philippians. And so that was what actually was done in the first century. If you look in Colossians 4, 16, it says, Now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So you can see here that they were to read the whole letter, and that's exactly what they did. And that's what we ought to do as well. 
In 1 Timothy 4, 12 and 13, look how it is the case that Timothy was to give attention to reading. And what that meant was to read in the public assembly, read the, the word of God to the people. Because during that time, you know, not very many people could read or write. It was a, there was only like 10% of the society that was literate. So you actually heard the word of God more than you read the word of God. So that's why he says, get attention to reading. But since we have the word of God today in our homes, it certainly is a great blessing for us to read it ourselves. Okay, our second point that we want to do is ignore chapter divisions. Now, why is that? Well, because chapter divisions are man-made. They were actually created in the, uh, actually about a thousand years after the Bible was written. And so it's very important that we ignore those because you'll see some really great truths when you ignore them. Let me give you an example of this. So Paul in Philippians 2 He's talking about, in verse 3, he says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each of you esteem others better than himself. And that's so very important because then he starts to talk about the mind of Christ and how Jesus was a servant and how we should have the mind of a servant. But as you can see, Paul is referring back to chapter 1. And I first came across this, I was like, Ah, this makes sense now, what he wrote in chapter 2, if only I ignored the chapter divisions. And so in chapter 1, he talks about two groups of preachers. And notice what he says. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my chains. But look at the second group. But the latter out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. So you see, there are two groups of preachers. One is preaching from selfish ambition and envy. The others are preaching out of love. Well, which one should I follow? Which one am I to be like? Do do motives matter? Of course they matter. I should be the ones that want to preach out of love. That's what we want to preach. And so we shouldn't be like that former group. To preach from selfish ambition and envy, that's not right. And so that's why when you go back to chapter 2, let nothing be done through selfish ambition. You see, he's connecting back to chapter 1. That's why we're to ignore these chapter divisions. Now, I want to skip some because um, for time's sake, because we need to get to the applications. So the third point is the P, the pinpoint. And what we want to do is when we study our Bibles, you want to pinpoint all the logical connections. It's amazing to me how the Bible is so logical because it comes from the God who created us to be a ra- rational. So, for example, you'll find the words in your Bible, the words for or because or be, therefore. And let me just give you an example of this. So in 1 Peter 1, notice what it says. Uh, since you have purified your souls, obeying the truth through the Spirit, and sincere love of the brethren, love one another firmly with a pure heart, having been born again. And then, so we're born again. But then, if you go to chapter 2, verse 1, therefore, therefore, he's connecting it back to chapter 1. He's connecting it back. So we've been born again, and, you know, that's what happens. You know, a baby is born, and he matures, he grows up. Well, after I've been born again, spiritually, then you're born, then you are to grow. And that's what he says. So, therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So that's what we're to do. Uh, Let me give you an example from the book of Hebrews. Now, we could read this whole thing in chapter 1, but I just want to give you an idea of what's being said here. So, for example, if you look in chapter 1, verse 5, I know it's hard to see this, but I highlighted the words in red. For to which of the angels did he ever say? And if I go forward... Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed, chapter 2, verse 1. For if the word spoken through angels, and you can just go on and on, and he mentions all these words that are in red that are logical connections. That's what I want you to get out of this. So you can see here even in chapter 2, verse 14, through chapter 3, verse 6. Now, what I want us to do is to pinpoint all the key words that are found in the subject matter that we're studying, because that's very important. We want to see what the inspired writer is saying what is important, not what we put into the text, but what they're saying to us. So what are some examples of this? Well, if you go back to Hebrews chapter 1, notice what I highlighted. 
we highlight the word angels, 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 angels. You think, he's, you think the Hebrew writer is talking about angels a lot in chapter 1? Certainly he is. And then you go down even into chapter 2. He talks about angels, 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 angels. Now, why is he talking about I, I, I even forgot to highlight one, a little lower than the angels. So you can see there, there's all these key words. And so why is this important? So let me ask you, brethren, because this is, this is a Bible class. Why does the Hebrews writer speak about the subject matter of angels, you think? Anybody got any ideas? Okay. Well, because we know that if we look in our Bibles, and of course Deuteronomy 33, verse 2, Acts 7, 38, and 53, Galatians 3, 19, what you would find is the law of Moses was delivered to Moses by the, by the mediation of angels. Okay, so if we put this in a logical connection here, we have God giving the angels, giving the law of Moses to Moses. Okay, so since Jesus is deity, he is the son of God, then Jesus is greater than the angels because Jesus gives us a better covenant. He, that's, what, that's why he's better than the angels. That's why he's better than the law of Moses. So, that, and the Hebrews writer, he's, he, all throughout the book of Hebrews, he's trying to talk about how Christianity is the better system that we're under today, not the law of Moses. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to skip this. This will be very important, but I want to get to, for example, I want to give you an example of 2 Peter chapter 1, just give you all these key words that you find. It's very interesting, and you can mark these in your Bible later. But to give you an example, I'm, I'm giving you the logical connections. So you have all these logical connections of also for this very reason, for, for, therefore, for so, for this reason. But if you go further and you put the key words in, wow, there's a lot to do with knowledge, to knowing God. That's very interesting. And then you have the word Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ. Why is that so, so important? Well, because... Jesus is our master, Jesus is our savior, and he is the Christ, he is the Messiah, he is the anointed one. You have the words remind or reminding or reminder, and that's important. We have to be reminded because as human beings, we forget things, and so we need to be constantly reminded of these things. Furthermore, there's the, uh, Peter talks about giving all diligence all diligence, put forth the best effort that you can. And that's what we're to do as Christians. So we're to be diligent to make your call and election sure. You can see uh, how, I'm going to skip that one if that's okay. But you can see how we're using all four of these as of right now. It's really amazing to me how you read the whole book. You, of course, ignore the chapter divisions. You pinpoint all the logical connections. And you pinpoint all the key words Inspire Writer is using. Now let's go to our L. Label the meaning of a word or phrase. Now, this is very important because, you know, some, sometimes we have the same word, but it can have different meanings. So, for example, the word grace. Does it, can it, someone tell me how grace is used in the Bible? Before I tell you. <laughs> how is grace used in the Bible? Nobody wants to <laughs> Well, the great word grace is the undeserved gift of salvation as used in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. But sometimes Paul uses it in a way that where he's talking about how that early church received miraculous gifts through the laying on of the apostles' hands. That's the, word, the way grace is used. Sometimes the way grace is also used is talking about the system, the, the New Testament system, the grace that is in Christ Jesus, for example, in 2 Timothy 2, 1. So that, just to give you an example of that. So here is an example where we have two different meanings of grace. For example, we have in 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 9, so you have in verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, certainly the Corinthian brethren had received grace because they obeyed the plan of salvation. But then he says, very interesting, he says, uh, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge. Well, he's certainly referring there to the miraculous gifts that they received. 
So you can see there's two meanings of the word grace here. Give you another example in Ephesians 4, 7 through 16. But, each, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Okay, well, what gifts are we talking about here? Well, he goes on. Now this he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first ascended to the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles. So there was the gift of apostleship. There was the gift of being a, becoming a prophet. And there's, so we see that it is the case that there was early church that received these miraculous gifts, and it's called grace. So that's something we need to recognize. Uh, here's an example of John 1 that I highlighted for you. It's very interesting. I call this the, the launching pad of John's gospel, how he has these theological rockets that shoot across throughout the gospel of John and land in different places. So, for example, the word witness, light, belief, you'll find all these words mentioned throughout the gospel of John, and it's very important to highlight these words when you're studying your Bible. So I just want to give you an example of that. Okay, so we label the meaning of a word in its given context. And then number six, here's something very important. This is something that we need to do. We enter the Bible with first century glasses on because it was written to a first century audience, but we have to make applications when necessary. So we do this great when it comes to the book of Revelation. Uh, you know, we say this was written to an audience in the first century, and a lot, the events that happened that John was prophesying of happened in the first century. We're good at that. But you have to realize the rest of the New Testament is also written in the first century. And so sometimes you have to recognize what was given in the first century. So let me give you an example of this. So 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1. I, I, I mentioned this because I actually asked a, a congregation. I said, okay, it says pursue love. And desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Can I obey that first commandment to pursue love? Yes or no? Yes. Can I desire spiritual gifts? Yes or no? Are you sure? Because uh, these are talking about desiring those gifts that are found in 1 Corinthians 12, those nine miraculous gifts. I mean, you can't really desire them because they're no longer around today. Is the apostles are long dead, and they were the ones who could lay their hands on those early Christians and give them these miraculous gifts. So really, you cannot perform, you cannot do this uh, commandment today, desire spiritual gifts. There's just no way, because it was given in the first century. See, that's what we need to understand, is that some, some things are permanent, but some things are temporary. And you can distinguish between the two because of the, the miraculous was for the first century. So let me, uh, let me give you an example of this. So let's use all these six principles. This is what I want to get to because I wasn't able to uh, uh, get to this in, at Cleveland. And I want to in this, in this uh, at Indianola. So let's use all six principles because we all understand in Acts 2.38, we understand that simple plan of salvation to repent and be baptized for remission of sins. But the question comes into being is, what is the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, there's been different positions that are given, and brethren have, you know, disagreed and, it's, and, it, and agreed to disagree. But I think if you use these six principles, you can understand the meaning of the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.38. So let's do what we would, we, we would do. Of course, I know we can't fulfill the first one. <laughs> we would spend all day here. But you read the whole book. But in this case, I would read also Luke and Acts. And the reason I say that is because Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke. But he's, it's connected to the, the book of Acts because they're both written to the same individual, Theophilus. And so you should read Luke and Acts. But then we're to ignore chapter divisions. And this is something that's very important that people need to understand. So if you go to Acts 1, notice he says... And being assembled together with them, he commanded them, and you can connect that back to chapter 1, verse 1. The apostles, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For, logical connection, for John truly baptized with water, but you, 
talking about the apostles, shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. But, and then I'm skipping to verse 8. But you, the apostles, shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Certainly, the apostles are going to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. That's the promise of the Father. Okay? Now, we're going to ignore chapter divisions, right? That's what we have to do. So notice this. We do this great. We say, okay, we know there's a difference between chapter 1 and chapter 2, but we need to connect them together because... It talks about how they chose Matthias to be a part, or the Lord chose Matthias to be a part of the apostle circle. And he says he was numbered with the 11 apostles. And if you go to chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they, well, who's they? Connect it back to chapter 1. So that's why we're ignoring chapter divisions. Furthermore, we want to pinpoint all the logical connections and we want to pinpoint all the key words that are found in that subject matter. So, uh, if you, I know it's hard to see on the screen, so I would urge you to turn to chapter 2 because we're going be, to be staying here for most of the time. Chapter 2, verses 14 through 36. So, notice this. Uh, it's very interesting. You can mark this in your Bible, but Peter, standing up with the eleven. Oh, who's that? The apostles. Because they were the ones baptized in the Holy Spirit. They're the ones that the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. They were speaking in different languages they had never studied before. So he gives this great gospel sermon. And I want you to see all the, I mean, you can mark in your Bibles yourself, but it's really amazing to me how he has all these logical connections throughout his sermon. And so that's very, very important. Now, here's some key words that, that he starts to talk about first. Notice that, they're, so the apostles are speaking different languages. There are people who think, oh, these guys are drunk. And, and Peter says, no, no, that's not what's going on. What we're doing is fulfilling the prophecy of Joel. And so it says in verse 17, it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I'll pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And all my men servants and all my maid servants shall pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs of the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. And he goes on to talk about that. But notice also the other key words. So, for example, I think it's very interesting that he uses the word Jesus of Nazareth. Why does, Je why does he say Jesus of Nazareth? Because there were actually a lot of Jewish men in the first century named Jesus. And he has to be specific and say, this is Jesus of Nazareth I'm talking about. Okay, and then he says, raised up, raised up, resurrection, raise up. Do you see the subject matter? It's talking about the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All right, and then he says, uh, he uses the words right hand. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. He's sitting right there, he's, and he reigns over the kingdom of God. And the signal that Jesus is reigning over the kingdom is because he has poured out the Holy Spirit upon the apostles. Okay, and then there's a case that you see here. He says the words, for example, flesh. Well, that means Jesus raised up in a bodily form. He didn't raise up in a spirit, a ghost. He raised up in his body is what Peter is referring to. So I just want to show you some of these key words that are used here. So if you look at, it's very interesting to see the logical connection that Peter makes in his sermon. So notice this. We're going to follow, we're going to follow through with this. With this. So First of all, remember the people saying, oh, you guys are drunk. You, you guys are drunk. Well, Peter says, no, it's, it's, that's not it. This is fulfilling the prophecy of Joel. And so he refers to the miraculous outpouring of the Holy Spirit in verses 16 through 21. But then he starts to talk about Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by miracles, wonders, and signs in, in verse 22 to 24. Why does he do that? Because miracles show someone to be a true messenger of God. Then he says, Jesus was crucified by lawless hands. He was, it, but this was determined by the eternal purpose and foreknowledge of God. This was God's plan all along in, in verses 22 through 24. Then it says, God raised Jesus up bodily from the grave. That's what, that's what God did in verse 24. Then he starts to say, okay, David 
a pro, he gives evidence for this. David prophesied about the resurrection of Christ in Psalm 16. And you can find this in verses 25 through 28. But then Peter says, but David was not speaking of himself because look over here. There's David's tomb. He, he's obviously not raised from the dead. So he, he was actually speaking of the resurrection of Christ. So that's verses 25 through 28. Then God swore by his own promise to David that David's descendant, the Messiah, would, would be raised up from the, to sit on David's throne. So we find that in verses 29 through 31. Then you go a little bit for, further. The apostles were to be the eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Christ. And certainly, this is why we believe Christianity to be true, because they are reliable eyewitnesses. So that's chapter 2, verse 32. Then he goes a little bit further. So since Jesus raised from the dead, and then he ascended into heaven, then he sat down at the right hand of God, and so Jesus was exalted to his right hand, the God's right hand, and he was given the promise to pour out the, whole, the promise of the Holy Spirit, which the audience was seeing and hearing. And so that connects back to chapter 2, verses 16 through 21. Now what's very interesting about this is when you go a little, a little bit further, so he, uh, Peter says, see, David, he didn't ascend into the heavens He's, to sit at God's right hand. He prophesied Jesus would sit at God's right hand, which is taken from Psalm 110. And, he, and this is found in chapter 2, verse 34 and 35. Now notice this, Jesus, who is, then he, said, he, he makes the conclusion of his sermons by saying, Jesus is the one who is both Lord and Christ. He is the one who reigns over the kingdom of God. He is also the one who is the Christ, the Messiah. So that's chapter 2, verse 36. So you can see what we're supposed to do here is label the meanings of the word in that given context of what Peter was preaching, and then also look at it in first century glasses. Uh, this is very, very, very important. So let's do that. So notice here, we're going back to where we're making all these key words. And I would urge you to make those key words in your Bible. But then I want you to see, we're going to focus on one key word, because he talks about the prophecy of Joel. Now I want to read it very carefully again. It says, this was what was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants, on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. So, I mean, just notice this pouring out of the spirit. That's certainly miraculous. It's the miraculous uh, power of the Holy Spirit being poured out. Now, I go down to verse 33 because you can see the logical connections that Peter makes. He says, Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He poured out this, which you now see in here. Is that miraculous? Certainly it's miraculous. And he's referring back to Acts 2, 17 through 21, the prophecy of Joel. Now you go a little bit further. I want you to see this. So we're looking at verse 33. Look at verse 33. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see in here. Uh, let me, so you remember that they, uh, Peter, he, he reached his sermon. He says, you crucified the Messiah. And they realized this. So they asked the question. They were convicted. Men and brethren, what shall we do? And what does Peter say? Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Nothing hard to understand about that. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now notice this. Notice the logical connection. For the promise. What promise? The promise he's just been referring to in his sermon. The promise of the Holy Spirit. It is to you and to your children and to all who are far off as many as the Lord our God will call. So you can see here, if you look very carefully, I want to show you something. This is very interesting. The gift of the Holy Spirit, the only other time that phrase is used is Acts 10.45. And it was referring to Cornelius and his household. And you'll remember the, the Holy Spirit directly came upon Cornelius and his household. And what did they do? They, they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Was that miraculous? Certainly. Notice this. For the promise is to you. 
So what promise? Well, we can go a little bit further. Uh, so the gift of the Holy Spirit, definitely referring back to the promise of the Holy Spirit. But we can see here, the promise of the Holy Spirit is referring to the pouring out of the Spirit. All to do with miraculous activity, friends. It's not, I don't think it's that difficult to understand. Notice this, for the promises to you and to your children. Well, very interesting. If you look back in Joe's prophecy, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Well, there's the logical connection there. So you can see there, for the promise is definitely referring to uh, the, the, how the children who become Christians, the apostles would lay their hands on these people and they would receive miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. Notice this, that as me as the Lord our God will call. That's used in Acts 13, verse 1. Now let me just show you the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 10, 45. And you can see that this is miraculous. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. Those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. So that's definitely miraculous. Now, here's the interesting thing about Acts 13. Like I said, that word call, the promises to you, to your children, as to me, as the Lord our God, make, or, and to all those who are far off, is, even as to me, as, the, uh, as our Lord our God will call. The word call there is used in Acts 13. It's not referring to the, the ordinary call of the gospel. It's actually something different. So when, when uh, they're about to go on their first missionary journey, it says the Holy Spirit says in verse 2, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. That's talking about being called to a special office. And it's used here in Acts 13 verse 9. Uh, sorry, Acts 13 verse 2 and Acts 2 39. So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say here is when you look at it with first century glasses, you can see that it's these early Christians who receive miraculous gifts by the laying on of the apostles' hands. That's what makes the most sense. The promise of the Holy Spirit in Joel's prophecy would be fulfilled through them. And it makes sense. If you put all this together, the promise being connecting back to pouring, uh, connecting back to shall prophesy, shall see visions, shall dream dreams. That's definitely referring to miraculous activity. I'm sorry, it, it seems to not have gotten to all of those for some reason. So if you put all of this together, you know, the pouring out of God's Holy Spirit was prophesied in the Bible. It's prophesied in Isaiah, Ezekiel, Joel, and Zechariah. And let me just show you real quick, it's very interesting here how this chart works out. So the apostles receive the immersion of the Holy Spirit. They're baptized with the Holy Spirit because it's overwhelming power. And you can find this in these verses. So the apostles, including Paul, since he was also an apostle, would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And since they were able to lay their hands on early Christians, then Acts 2, those, those Jews received miraculous power of the Holy Spirit because what are they going to do? How, how are they going to tell... Uh, when they go back to their homeland, how are they going to tell that God has changed things, that God, we're no longer under the old covenant, we're under the new covenant now? Well, if they were given a miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit, they can definitely show they're a true messenger of God and change and, and convert their uh, Jewish brethren to the truth. And then, of course, since the Samaritans received the miraculous gifts in Acts 8, Peter and John came to them and laid their hands on them so that they might receive the miraculous, uh, miraculous gifts. You go to Cornelius in Acts 10 and 11. The reason this is directly in a manner from heaven was because they were Gentiles. It was to show that they were fit subjects to enter into God's kingdom. Now, when they, were, they had to obey the gospel, they had to be baptized in water for the remission of their sins so that they could be added to the church. Then you have the Corinthians in Acts 18. In 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, Paul obviously laid his hands on them and they were very, received miraculous gifts. Obviously, the Ephesians in Acts 19, 1 through 9, and Timothy, he received a miraculous uh, gift from Paul. We see Philip's family, the four daughters who could prophesy in Acts 21, verse 9. We see the Romans in Romans 12, 6 through 8. Obviously, some of them were already given miraculous gifts, but Paul was coming so that, he could, that he could, they could receive more miraculous gifts. 
Then you have Luke, Mark, Titus, James, Jude. They, they obviously had to be in, uh, receive miraculous gifts so that they could write down the scriptures, write down parts of the New Testament for us to read. So what am I, what am I trying to say? All these people, apostles and prophets, they gave us the word of God. They gave us the New Testament. And you see, the New Testament is what transforms our character. It changes us. And that's what Isaiah 32 talks about when you read it. It's interesting. It talks about peace. It talks about tranquility. Because without the outpowering of the Holy Spirit, without that miraculous activity given to these early Christians, friends, we would not have the Bible as we have it today. Because they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write it down for us. And so when we, when we read and study the Word of God, it transforms us. We can have that peace and quietness and assurance. So I hope you can see uh, how we can put all six of these principles together. Uh, so we read the whole book. We ignore all the chapter divisions. We pinpoint all the logical connections. We pinpoint all the key words. We label the meaning and with its given context, and then we look at it with a first century glasses on. And that's why I, I believe you can see now what the gift of the Holy Spirit was in Acts 2.30. It's very simple to understand and, and what it means. And so I hope you can see that that's, that, of course, you know, there are permanent commands. There's still sin today. There's still people who are in sin, and they need to change. They need to repent. And what can wash away our sins? Well, it's baptism because you come into contact with the blood of Christ. But you can see that those early Christians were, were going to be promised the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is referring to a miraculous gift in that, in that context. Now, a lot of people often say to me, well, Shane, what about the dwelling of the Holy Spirit? Well, the dwelling of the Holy Spirit is not talked about in Acts 2.38. It's talked about in other New Testament passages that when we obey the gospel, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit dwell in the heart of a Christian. And it's because we obey the word of God that God comes and he reigns in our hearts and our lives. So I hope that makes sense. Um, I'm sure time is gone or not yet. Anybody have any questions or, or anything? Is, I mean, how much, how much time we got? Oh, we got three minutes? All right. Well, I, I went through faster than I expected. I, I Cleveland, I didn't get through, uh, able to get through this material. Now I, I did it too short. Let me give you some, uh, I did actually put some things in here that you could do if you want to do an Ecclesiastes. I'm just giving you an idea. But you can find keywords in the classes, and you can find what Solomon was writing about here, for example. So he talks about, for example, being wise, knowing the heart, Vanity of vanities. So I'm just giving you some ideas here. Um, if you, so if, you, if you'd be all right, I'm going to end my lesson early. And I, I really appreciate being with you today. Uh, let me just go ahead and tell you uh, a little bit about myself because I haven't done that yet. Uh, but Emily and I are working with World Evangelism. We did start with it in uh, March of 2019 last year. And so let me just uh, propose to you, uh, we're, we're new members of the team, so to speak. And we're still uh, trying to raise personal support. So if anyone is here that can personally help support us, I would greatly, we would greatly appreciate it. You know, with COVID, the pandemic happening, we haven't been able to go make have many appointments for various churches. And so if you're able to help us, I pray, Lord willing, we'll be able to go to um, uh, India, hopefully in the springtime of 2021, Lord willing, and we're supposed to go to Fiji. We're supposed to also uh, to teach the book of Galatians or teach another book, possibly. Uh, it hasn't been, uh, it's tentative right now. And then I hope we go to Myanmar next year. So there's various places that, are op uh, that we have tentatively, tentatively opened. Hopefully that, Lord willing, we will be able to go. Uh, if you don't mind, let me just lead us in a word of prayer, and, and then we'll be done with our study today. Father, we're very thankful that we get to study from your divine word. Father, we're very thankful that there are so many great truths that are found in your word that we can really uh, follow and we can understand. Father, we're very thankful for the lesson that we have. And Father, we know that uh, we know it's full of uh, 
knowledgeable principles that we can use, but I pray, Lord, that we can also, when we're using these six principles, that we'll be able to make some more needed applications for our lives. Father, we're so thankful for your word. We're thankful that you delivered it to us through inspired men of old. And Father, we pray that we will be transformed in the image of your son. Help us to live by faith and to walk in your light. I pray for the Indianola congregation, Lord. Be with her and be with uh, the leadership here. And Father, I pray for your will to be done in our lives. Help us to keep on walking in your light. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.